بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين يبايعونك إنما يبايعون الله يد الله فوق أيديهم فمن نكث فإنما ينكث على نفسه ومن أوفى بما واهد عليه الله فسيؤتيه أجرا عظيما I was born into a Muslim family, linked by heredity to the Prophet Muhammad. May peace be upon him and his family. Historically, Ismailis are united by a common allegiance to the living hereditary Imam of the time, in the progeny of Islam's last and final Prophet, Muhammad. May peace be upon him, through his daughter Fatima, and her husband, Hazrat Ali, the Prophet's cousin and the first Shia Imam. Sayyidna Nasir e Husro embarked on a physical and spiritual journey after a personal awakening at the age of 40. He travelled across the Muslim world of the 11th century in search of a deeper spiritual understanding. In the following poem, he reflects on the verse in the Holy Quran, which says that pledging allegiance or bayah to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, is the same as pledging allegiance to Allah. Living four centuries after the Prophet's death, he wondered on whose hand he could pledge his allegiance. Once I happened to read in the Qur'an the verse of the oath, the verse in which God said that his hand was stretched above. I asked a question from myself. What had happened to that tree, that hand? Where can I now find that hand, that oath, that place? Whose hand should we touch when swearing allegiance to God? Or should not divine justice treat equally those who came first and those who came later? Travelling to Fatimid Cairo, then under the rule of the Ismaili Imams, Sayyidna Nasir Husro found the answer to his question in the person of Mawlana al-Mustansir Billah alayhi salam, the 18th Ismaili Imam and 8th Fatimid Caliph to whom he pledged his allegiance. The Ismaili Imamat is a Muslim institution of spiritual and worldly leadership that traces its origins to the succession of Prophet Muhammad. In grappling with the question of who should lead the Muslim community, two main interpretations emerged through history. The Sunni interpretation held that the Prophet did not nominate a successor, whereas the Shia affirmed that at Ghadira Qum, the Prophet designated his cousin and son-in-law, Hazrat Ali alayhi salam, as the first Imam in a line of hereditary spiritual guides. Today, the Ismailis are the only Shia branch that has followed an unbroken hereditary line of living Imams for over 14 centuries. Throughout history, Ismailis have pledged their allegiance or bayah to the Imam of the time, which is the acceptance of the permanent spiritual bond between the Imam and his follower, or murid. This allegiance unites the Jamaat worldwide in their love, devotion and obedience to the Imam of the time. When referring to their love for the Prophet's family, the Shia cite the following ayah of the Qur'an. 
Say, I do not ask of you any reward for the conveying of revelation, except love for my relatives. The 14th Ismaili Imam, 4th Fatimid Caliph and founder of the city of Cairo, Molan al-Moyiz alayhi salam, when speaking about the relationship between the Imam and his murids, is reported to have said, Even when you are physically away from us, our souls are together in our mutual love for each other. Your souls are close to us, even if our bodies and locations are apart. This same sentiment has been echoed by Maulana Hazar Imam on many occasions. I would like, on this occasion also, to tell my Jamaat that the love of the Imam knows no physical boundaries, no mountain, no river, no desert, can stop the love of the Imam for his Jamaat worldwide. This bond of love and devotion has underpinned the Imam Murid relationship throughout history. Since 1957, Maulana Hazar Imam has devoted all of his time, energy, and resources to the spiritual and worldly progress of Ismailis everywhere. His spiritual guidance has constantly emphasized the eternal nature of the soul, the necessity of prayer and constant remembrance of Allah, the role of the intellect in understanding matters of faith, the balance of spiritual and material life, and living by the ethics of the faith. In emphasizing the ethic of caring for those in need and improving their quality of life, Maulana Hazar Imam has worked tirelessly to build the global capacity of the Jamaati institutions and the Aga Khan Development Network and has navigated the Jamaat in various parts of the world through times of crisis and times of prosperity. Reciprocal expressions of love, devotion and gratitude are found in Ismaili poetry throughout history and across geography. One such example is from the Ginan Abateri Mohobet Alagi Meri Sahib, attributed to Pir Shams. <laughs> For your face I am all athirst, my Lord. Grant me the gift, that gift of your sight, now that I am in love with you, my Lord. When the face was seen, there was joy at heart. Pir Shams told the tale. Now I am in love with you, my Lord. My heart is stricken now with love for you. This bond of love has inspired members of the Jamaat to selflessly serve the Imamat including offering their time, knowledge and material support. The celebration of Imamat Jubilees has provided an occasion for the Jamaat to reflect and give thanks for this unique spiritual bond that links each murid to the Imam of the time and to offer their services. On this most special, auspicious and happy day, Maulana Hazri Imam, we are here to submit two simple messages from all your Jamaats. Mubarak and Shukran. Thank you for your love, your inspiration, your guidance, your compassion and your protection. Jubilees have been observed in many cultures and faiths. In the Abrahamic tradition, jubilees marked fixed time periods or other special occasions. More recently, the British monarchy began commemorating jubilees during the 19th century, becoming monumental occasions in Queen Victoria's reign, during which she marked three jubilees. Although they were not called jubilees, beginning in the time of the 16th century Emperor Akbar, the Mughal emperors in India held ceremonies twice a year where they were weighed against precious metals. This 17th century painting depicts the Emperor Jahangir's son Prince Khurram 
later known as the Emperor Shah Jahan, being weighed in gold on his 15th birthday. The money collected was distributed to the poor and the needy, thus contributing to the betterment of their societies and subjects, rooted in the social ethic of concern for the most vulnerable in society. In the recorded history of the Ismailis, Maulana Hazar Imam is the fifth Imam to attain 60 years of Imamat. Two Imams of the medieval period are also said to have reached 60 years of Imamat. These are the 29th Imam Maulana Qasim Shah alayhi salam, who lived in Azerbaijan during the 14th century, and the 37th Imam Maulana Dhulfiqar Ali alayhi salam, who is buried alongside several other Imams in the village of Anjudan in Iran. The 46th Imam, Maulana Hassan Ali Shah alayhi salam, was the third Imam to reach 60 years of Imamat. After acceding to the Imamat in 1817, the title of Aga Khan was bestowed on him by the Shah of Persia, thus making 2017 the 200th anniversary of the Imamat under the four Aga Khans. During the 1840s, Maulana Hassan Ali Shah migrated to India, bringing to a close almost seven centuries during which the Imamat was based in Persia. The 48th Imam Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah alayhi salam, known as Aga Khan III, had the longest Imamat in history at 72 years, during which he worked to reorganize the Jamaat's institutions in the face of rapid historical changes. He emphasized high standards of both male and female education, health and social well-being, as well as developing a new network of councils for administering the affairs of his community, establishing Ismaili constitutions for the Jamaat's social governance in various regions where the Jamaat lived. He was also a renowned statesman who worked for the progress of humanity at large. He was actively involved in the independence movement of the colonized Indian subcontinent from British rule and served as president of the League of Nations, the forerunner to the United Nations. The commemoration of Jubilees began during his imamat with public celebrations for his golden, diamond and platinum Jubilees, marking 50, 60 and 70 years as imam. The Jubilees emerged from the Jamaat's desire to celebrate these milestones. In each case, the Jamaat's leadership submitted a request to commemorate the Jubilee, to which the Imams graciously agreed. These commemorations have served as an opportunity for members of the Jamaat to reaffirm their bayah to the Imam of the time and to show their happiness and gratitude for his love, guidance and protection. While media attention during Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah's Jubilee celebrations focused on the weighing ceremonies, the true purpose of the Jubilees has been their long-term impact, providing unique springboards for the material and social progress for both Ismailis and wider society. These celebrations, if looked upon as mere glorification or even as only thanksgiving for my 60 years of Imamat, would not be worth the enormous discomfort, expense, and sacrifices they have entailed on some 40,000 people. No, but it has given us the opportunity for which I have been waiting for many years to carry out a fundamental change in the economic sphere of the lives of my spiritual children. Under such circumstances, the Diamond Jubilee came as a unique opportunity for bringing about some radical changes not only materially, but of the general outlook amongst my people. Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah's Golden Jubilee occurred on 18th August 1935. Ceremonies were held in Bombay, India in January 1936, including the weighing of the Imam against gold, which was presented to him as a Nazrana, or unconditional gift. He declared that he was returning it to the Jamaat for their own benefit and upliftment, allocating funds for overseas scholarships, resettlement from congested districts and infant welfare projects. 
The following day, after the weighing ceremony had taken place, the Imam cancelled the remaining celebrations upon learning of the death of King George V, the British monarch and emperor of India. Over a year later, on 1st March 1937, a ceremony was held in Nairobi, Kenya. The Nasrana was used to fund programs for scholarships, secondary schools, child welfare centres and nursing homes. Notably, the Jubilee Insurance Company was established to provide insurance plans for Ismailis and to enhance their financial stability and outlook. Many members of the Jamaat had little access to insurance or understanding of what it was. So the Imam used the Jubilee Nasrana to help provide the Jamaat with a sounder economic base. Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah postponed his Diamond Jubilee celebrations marking 60 years of Imamat in light of the post-war period in 1945. Two ceremonies were held in Bombay and Dar es Salaam in 1946, in which Ismailis from Persia, Syria, Central Asia and Europe participated. The Imam accepted the Nasrana of his weight in diamonds. As everyone is well aware, the value of these diamonds has been unconditionally presented to me on this occasion. I do not wish to take this amount for myself, but to use it for any object that I think is best for my spiritual children. I've come to the conclusion that the very best use in the long run that I can make of it is the whole of the residue must be given as an absolute gift to the Diamond Jubilee Investment Trust. Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah sought to build a new financial outlook amongst the Jamaat. The establishment of an investment trust allowed for greater financial stability for the Jamaat by providing loans for the construction of commercial buildings, housing and business ventures. The outcome of the Jubilee helped and continued to help the community progress in terms of education, health and economics. Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah's Platinum Jubilee, marking 70 years of Imamat, was commemorated in ceremonies in Karachi in 1954 and Cairo in 1955. The Nasrana was allocated to the Platinum Jubilee Finance and Investment Corporation, which also contributed towards building schools, housing and economic investment and infrastructure in Asia and Africa. Through his long imamat, Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah significantly progressed the Jamaat's economic and educational outlook and status. His aim was that more Ismailis should be home and business owners and receive formal education so as to ensure the Jamaat's economic stability. In 1957, I became the 49th hereditary imam of the Shia imami Ismaili Muslims, when my grandfather designated me to succeed him. Succeeding to the Imamat on 11th July 1957, Maulana Hazar Imam's Thaknashini ceremonies took place in Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, Kampala, Karachi, Bombay and Dhaka. The years of development and change which lie ahead are certain to throw up many new problems. We should not be afraid of these. You will surely surmount them if you stand by your faith and meet your difficulties in the spirit of humility and tolerance which our religion demands of us. This is especially important for the younger generations who will have to carry the future on their shoulders. Only the faith of your father can sustain you and enable you to live in peace here in this world and in the next. 
As with his grandfather before him, the anniversaries of Maulana Hazar Imam's accession to the Imamate have provided opportunities for launching significant initiatives and legacy institutions. On the 10th anniversary of his Imamate in 1967, the Aga Khan Foundation was launched to implement innovative, community-driven solutions to development challenges. The 20th anniversary saw the founding of the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London and the establishment of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. On 11th July 1982, Maulana Hazar Imam commemorated 25 years of Imamat at his residence at Aiglemont in France. Today is the day which is much more than many happy days that we have been blessed with. And on behalf of all your spiritual children throughout the world, Maulana Hazar Imam, it is with the utmost humility that I submit to you our felicitation on the occasion of the Silver Jubilee of your Imamate. On the occasion of the Silver Jubilee, the Jamaat presented a Nasrana, which the Imam allocated to various projects in consultation with community leaders. Let us now look to the horizon of the future. We must continue to build on solid foundations. Let us strengthen today's fabric of institutions and programs so as to have them contribute the full impact of their potential on the quality of life of the Jamaat. Let us address wisely those difficult problems which clearly await and call for resolution such as the adaptation of the Jamaats, and more particularly their second and third generations, to living in the Western world. Let us think clearly how these spiritual children can establish soundly the foundations of a good and proper life, and then extend their hand of support to their brothers and sisters in less privileged parts of the world. In responding to the needs of newly established Jamaats in the Western world, the Silver Jubilee allowed for the establishment of new Jamaat Khanas and institutions, most significantly the Ismaili centres in London and Burnaby, which were the first of a global network of ambassadorial buildings. At the foundation ceremony of the Ismaili centre Burnaby, the Imam spoke of its significance. During the Jubilee year, many new projects will be launched which will impact the material quality of the life of Ismailis, as indeed of many others. This is the first project to be launched during this Jubilee year. And it is very important that it is a place of worship. The significance of this ceremony is further enhanced by the fact that this is the first Jamaat Khanna to be built in North America. It is my hope that it will become a symbol of a growing understanding in the West of the real meaning of Islam. Additionally, the ruler of Dubai gifted the Imam a piece of land on which would eventually be built the Ismaili Centre Dubai, opened 25 years later during the Golden Jubilee in 2008. Perhaps the most significant legacy of the Silver Jubilee was the granting of the charter of the Aga Khan University by the President of Pakistan. AKU today has grown into an international university with campuses in multiple countries in Asia, Africa and Europe, aiming to serve as an essential catalyst for societal development, beginning with healthcare. The charter which is excellent to the President has been gracious enough to grant the new Aga Khan University. Creates the first university inspired by my family since Al Azhar was founded in the Fatimid dynasty's capital of Cairo in 970, a thousand years before we laid the foundation stone of the Aga Khan Medical College on this site in 1971. My prayer is that the university we are now building will enable many generations of students to acquire both knowledge and the essential spiritual wisdom needed to balance that knowledge and enable their lives to attain the highest fulfillment. Today, the Aga Khan University, together with the University of Central Asia, 
aims to be a major catalyst for social progress and development, not only for Ismailis but for all people in the societies in which they operate and beyond. Following the Silver Jubilee, Maulana Hazrimam continued to mark significant milestones. The first global Ismaili constitution was ordained during the 30th year of his imamate on 13th December 1986, marking Maulana Hazrimam's 50th birthday. The signing of this constitution, which replaced earlier constitutions in various regions, represented the first time in 14 centuries that all Ismailis worldwide were bound to the Imamate by a single written document bearing the seal of the Imam of the time. On 11th July 1997, the 40th anniversary of his Imamate, Maulana Hazar Imam met with global Jamaati leaders at the Ismaili Centre, London. He announced that he was making grants to build endowments for the long-term financial capacity and security of the Imamat institutions. On 11th July 2007, Ismaili leaders from around the world gathered at Eglamont to pay homage for Maulana Hazar Imam's Golden Jubilee. For the first time in history, the global Jamaat had the opportunity to view the ceremony through a worldwide telecast. Over the course of the Jubilee year, the Imam travelled to 22 countries over 18 months, strengthening the Imamat's partnerships with governments and civil society, and establishing new institutions. The Golden Jubilee laid the foundation for tackling multi-generational social problems such as the alleviation of poverty, improving care for the elderly and establishing institutions and Jamaat Khanas in parts of the world where such infrastructure was lacking. Building on a long-standing tradition of offering service to the Imam and following his guidance, the Jamaat's Nasrana was not only offered as material gifts but also as gifts of time and knowledge, offered in service to strengthen the Imamat institutions. The Golden Jubilee provided an opportunity to develop a formalized structure for this purpose, and thus, the time and knowledge Nasrana is an important legacy of the Golden Jubilee. I would like you to understand why it is that this Nasrana on this occasion is so important. It is clear that progress around the world is linked to access, to understanding, to participating in the knowledge society. And what that means is that our institutions should be led and should be offering to the people who use them, not only the knowledge of today, but what will be the critical knowledge for tomorrow. And this is why this Nazrana of time and knowledge, of knowledge which is shared amongst the brotherhood of our Jamaat around the world, is such an important gift to the Jamaat and to the people amongst whom the Jamaat lives. A number of Golden Jubilee institutions were also initiated, including the foundation ceremonies for the Bujagali Hydropower Plant in Uganda and two Aga Khan Academies, as well as the opening of the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat in Canada. The secondary teacher education program at the Institute of Ismaili Studies was launched as an endeavour to professionalise religious education for the Jamaat. The Imamat Jubilees from the time of Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah's Golden Jubilee until today have served as unique opportunities to make a significant impact on the spiritual and material lives of the global Jamaat and the societies in which they live. They have been part of a wider project under the leadership of the Imamat 
to progress the Jamaat's educational and economic base, transforming the Jamaat into a community that today is of national and international standing, that is able to compete in a meritocratic world and contributes to the uplift and progress of humanity at large. These include the wide variety of activities under the umbrella of the Aga Khan Development Network in areas of health, education, culture and economic development. Maulana Hazar Imam's engagement in diplomacy and bridge building with governments and civil society institutions around the world to foster peace and a better future for all is widely respected. The role of the Ismaili Imam is a spiritual one. His authority is that of religious interpretation. At the same time, Islam believes fundamentally that the spiritual and material worlds are inextricably connected. Faith does not remove Muslims or their Imams from daily practical matters in family life, in business, in community affairs. Faith, rather, is a force that should deepen our concern for our worldly habitat, for embracing its challenges, and for improving the quality of human life. The endeavors of the Ismaili Imamat over the past six decades reflect the permanent spiritual bond between the Imam and his murids, as well as Islam's ethical responsibility to help the poor and those in need to improve their lives regardless of their spiritual affiliation. As a Jamaat, we owe a debt of gratitude and shukrana to Maulana Hazar Imam for his immense love and tireless dedication towards progressing the Jamaat both spiritually and materially. As you know, I am ambitious for my Jamaat. I am ambitious for my Jamaat worldwide. Wherever a murid is living, he or she is an immediate concern the amount of the time. And this has been my life since 1957 and it will continue to be my life.